So this is the self-development with tactics. Book. So, hello, we're back to the next episode of the Self-Development with Tactics podcast. And, um, yeah, today we once again do something completely different. And um, I'm actually lying in my bed, which is the first time I'm doing that. But I, I don't know, I just feel like doing that. Um, we are gonna talk about and or read some poetry once again. I kind of feel like that... It is something pretty amazing, especially for the podcast listeners. Um, for all the YouTube viewers, I'm actually very sorry because there is no video. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I really felt like, you know, let's just record something. But I don't want to have a video. I don't actually know why there is not, you know, it's it's a bit more work. So it might come from there. But, but not that much as, as, you know, as if it would be something kind of clear for me but yeah anyway neutral tones by thomas hardy we stood by a pond that winter day and the sun was white as though gin of god and a few leaves lay on a starving zot they had fallen from an ash and were gray your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago and some words played between us to and fro and which lost the more by our love. The smiling mouth was the deadest thing, alive enough to have strength to die, and the grin of bitterness swept thereby like an uh, um, ominous bird a wing. Since then keen lessons that love decides and wings with wrong have shaped to me, your face in the God-cursed sun and a tree and a bond Etched with greyish leaves. Yeah. Let's see if I can, you know, find a bit more. Um, bird understander. Let's see what this is about. I don't know. Of many reasons I love you here is one. And the way you write me from the gate at the airport so I can tell you everything will be alright. So you can tell me there is a bird trapped in a terminal all the people ignoring it because they do not know what to do with it except to leave it alone until it scares itself to death it makes you terribly terribly sad you wish you could take the bird outside and set it free or feeling that call a bird understander to come help the bird all you can do is notice the bird and feel for the bird and write to tell me how languages feel impossibly useless but you are wrong you're a bird, understander, better than I could ever be, who make so many noises and call them song. These are your own words, your way of noticing and saying plainly, of not turning away from hurt. You have offered them to me, I am only giving them back, if only I could show you how very useless they are not. Well, I gotta have to be honest, like I don't understand anything. <laughs> Let's actually see it. Um, prose um poets i'm gonna go for poems um audio poems poem of the day poems for teens uh, what is the poem of the day maybe baseball and classicism every day i pursue the box course for hours and sometimes i wonder why i do it since i'm not going to take a test on it and no one is going to give me money pleasure something like that of codes of deciphering oh it's going on i guess uh, um, of deciphering an ancient alphabet say so as so as brightly to picturize aridus in the illusion fields on her perfect day today she went five for five against vic raji well once again me not understanding anything um birthday um, what about prose? Maybe prose are better. Harriet blog collections. Listen. Hmm. 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 Are there stoic poems? I wonder. I wonder if there are, but there must be. Some ancient stoic poems. Donald Robertson. Well, let's actually have a look. 
Maybe there's something amazing. And the position that I'm lying in is just really uncomfortable. Let's do it like that. I don't know if it makes sense, but anyway. Some Asian Stoic poems. Scene of Stidium. No, let's just, you know, let's just give it a go. The cold of winter and the ceaseless rain come powerless against him. Weak the dart of the fiercest summer sun or racking pain. To bend that iron frame, he stands apart, unspoiled by public feast and jollity. Jollity, I'm sorry. Patient, unwearing, unwearied night and day doth he cling to his studious studies of philosophy. An author quoted by Diogenes Laertius. Here lies great Zeno, dear to Sidium, who scaled high Olympus, though he piled not Pelion on Ossa, nor toiled at the labors of Heracles, but this was the path he found out to the stars, the way of temperance alone. Very interesting things there, you know, but I just, you know, uh, am I too dumb or just, I don't know. The title of the short yet powerful poem is Invictus, like Invictus Aqua de Perfume, which in Latin means unconquered. It was written by the English author William Ernest Henley, um, who in 1875 was recovering from the amputation of his leg due to severe tuberculosis. Um, this degree of illness and surgery in the 80s uh, very often led to fatal outcomes. It was there in his recovery room, Henley found that the strength and yodded down the verses that soon became the powerful poetic writ writing known as Invictus. Let's um, get me to Invictus, please. I want to read it. I want to read it. I want to see what it is. I want to see if it is good. Invictus by William Ernest Henley. I know him. I dearly know him. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fellow clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud under the blood goings of chance. My head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments, the scroll, I am the mastery of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. I've read that before, you know, but as a quote, interestingly. Invictus is a forced dancer rhythming poem in uh, I what I am big Theatramitr, that is, with four beats or stresses in each line, occasional spondee secure to sharpen up this steady rhythm. The end rhymes are all full, so the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and G, H, G, H. This helps keep the whole poem tight. Uh, stanza by stanza analysis. First stanza. Out of the night that covers me, Black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. The imaginary is strong, it is night time, the dark covers everything in black. The night then becomes a symbol of hopelessness, a depressive medium in which the soul is lost. The future cannot be seen. This is familiar or similar in feeling to the idea of uh, Saint Jean of the Cross, the Spanish mystic, writing in the 16th century of the dark night of the soul, where the human spirit has lost its normal confident, self-assured status. Although the poem doesn't explicitly mention Christianity, there is a sense that this opening line is rooted in religiousness. The speaker is coming out of a period of total darkness, a hell. The second line reinforces the first, the black pit, suggesting that this was a deep depression, a spiritual darkness, covering the whole world, the whole world being that of the speaker, and lines three and four acknowledge that help was given somewhere, somehow, perhaps by a deity or deities, not by any named god or specific creator. The speaker implies that their unconquerable soul is a gift from a godly, godly realm. It is not quite prayer, but it is grateful thanks. The second stanza. 
In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludge goings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. There is an interesting start to this second quatrain. Fell clutch is delicious wording for the reader's tongue and, sp and basically means cruel grasp. The speaker stating clearly that despite being tightly held in an awful situation, they didn't once give in or show signs of weakness. Note how the speaker is at first subject to the negative, but then responds in positive fashion, a repeated theme throughout the poem. The third and fourth lines follow a similar path. There is strong assonance, use of repeated vowels. Under the blood goings of chance, my head is bloody, but I'm bowed. Blood goings bloody. The speaker here is suggesting that despite being battered and wounded, there is still no subservient or self-pitying bow of the head. The head is still held high. The third stanza. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms what the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. The speaker looks into the future, taking into account all the anger and pain associated with life on earth and particularly in places such as hospitals. The horror of the shade could be some hellish place of dark where depression lies, a menacing thought. Again, the reader is advised that there will be no capitulation, no giving in. In fact, the speaker has been unafraid throughout the ordeal, which has lasted years and will continue to show a brave face. The message is unaligned. The speaker has a clear intention to survive against all the odds. Fourth stanza. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate and I am the master I am the captain of my soul. The climax, climax to the poem contains an allusion to the Christian Bible. New Testament Matthew 7, 13 slash 14, where Jesus says, Straight is the gate and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Um, what is the speaker suggesting when the words, It matters not how are placed, uh, how are placed in front of straight the gate. This is the gate that leads to the heavenly life. Conversely, the second line is an inference to the depths of hell, the punishments being the sins written down during a lifetime. The speaker is affirming that whether a person believes in heaven and hell or not, the plain fact is that the individual is in charge, is in control of their own fate, and experienced pain and distress for many years, the poem is rooted in the awful circumstances he found himself in when a boy and a young man. More importantly, the poem's message is universal in its appeal. It says quite empathetically that it doesn't matter who you are, believer or not, you can overcome dark times by being brave and never losing faith in your own soul's strength. Little wonder that many famous and many unknown people over the years have used the inspiration of this poem to help them face personal trials and tribulations. And yeah, this is actually a pretty nice article, a pretty neat one. And um, also just, you know, gonna end the episode there, you know. So I wish you the best health of happiness and also success and also hope that you're gonna remind yourself and you're gonna be remembered, which basically means your legacy and basically means just being a nice person. And therefore also just being remembered as a nice person, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. Three other things that I want to give you are why are you here, what I try to change, and what is bothering you the most is three things I hope are going to show you your purpose, maybe even a business idea. And the last question and or thought that I'm having for you is, what could you essentially say to another person that is indeed going to change their life? Because I totally believe that we all can say something that we all can communicate something that is indeed going to change somebody's life. And with that being said, please take care of yourself, your family members and all family members and all of your loved ones and friends and whatnot. And I'm going to see you the next time, I at least hope so. Bye-bye.